Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin at the top of the hour and will be recorded. Connect with the campaign for grade level reading on social media. On Facebook, um, like the page campaign for GLR and on Twitter, follow the account at reading by third. Please feel free to use the hashtag learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar and we will be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, the campaign wants to connect with you on social media, so go ahead and like the page campaign for GLR on Facebook. Follow the account at Reading by Third on Twitter. And like I said, the webinar will begin shortly. Alrighty, once again, um, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sierra Sanchez, and I will be behind the scenes helping to produce this webinar. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. So first, we would love if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city or state and your organization. And be sure to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. Again, all attendees are in listen only mode, but we encourage your engagement by posting questions in the Q&A box. And we will be dedicating the last 20 to 30 minutes to respond to the questions that you post during the discussion. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed on Friday to all those who are registered. Also, this webinar is being live streamed on Facebook and we welcome all of you to check it out there as well. And lastly, we will be posting a brief on screen evaluation during Q and a and we highly encourage you to respond. This just helps us uh, with our commitment to continuous improvement within the campaign. And lastly, before we start, I would just like to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. They are always from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time, unless they are specifically noted, uh, such as this uh, next week's upcoming one. This is a special webinar on prioritizing learning amidst COVID, essential guidance for schools and parents. Uh, this will be Tuesday, September 8th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time and 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. And then again on September 8th at 3 p.m. and 12 p.m. Pacific time, we will have PBS partners presenting their all new Ready to Learn uh, funded PBS Kids Preschool uh, Science Property and how to use it as a vehicle to support educators and parents. And we will be sure to add a link in the chat box for more information and registration for these upcoming opportunities. And now joining you now is Yoli Flores, Chief Learning Officer for the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Sierra, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited about today's webinar, How States Can Close the Distance Learning Digital Divide, a look at three principles and three state models. If you're one of the 5,000 individuals or more that have joined us for our weekly learning conversation since we la launched last September, but especially those of you that have participated since March of this year, you'll know that the campaign has made learning loss recovery a priority for our work. Through this webinar series, we've delved into issues related to COVID related school closures and the impact on learning, especially for low income families, children from low income families. We've focused on the role of philanthropy, the federal stimulus bills, digital equity issues, the role of broadband media and more. This is our third webinar focused on digital equity. Our first webinar on this topic uh, was on May 26, where we examined the scope, the extent, the dimensions of the digital equity problem. 
on August 4th, we began looking at solutions at the local and municipal level. We learned about emerging and scalable solutions, including the work in Chicago with Chicago counts and other communities. Today, we'll turn to solutions coming from states. Our partners at Common Sense Media and Education Superhighway are tracking statewide efforts and specifically looking at three principles for closing the home digital divide. We'll also hear from our commentator from our other partner at New America, uh, who again has been joining us on this series uh, related to the digital uh, equity divide. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome Dr. Lori Stryker, a consultant with the Patterson Foundation, who will moderate and lead this conversation. But let me just share a little bit about Dr. Stryker. Dr. Stryker, as I said, is a consultant working now with private foundations to facilitate, develop, and implement innovative education strategies. She's worked with the Patterson Foundation on education initiatives over the past 10 years. She is managing the Patterson Foundation's Digital Access for All initiative, which is exploring ways communities and organizations are approaching digital inclusion. The work is focused on a 700,000 population region in Florida's West Coast. Lori spent her career in education as Florida's Deputy Education Commissioner and President of the University of South Florida Sarasota campus. Effective deployment of education technology has been a long-standing aspiration and interest. So given her extensive background, her commitment and interest in this work, we're so pleased and honored that she, was, that she would join us as our moderator. So welcome, Dr. Stryker. I hand it over to you and look forward to our presentation. Uh, thank you, Yoli. I appreciate that introduction and I look forward to this afternoon. I've been watching on chat uh, as people have put up where they're from and I can see we're coast to coast and have a good representation of people who are at working at all levels of, uh, of uh, the interest not only in this topic, but obviously advancing our uh, campaign for grade level reading nationally. I want to welcome you to today's learning loss recovery discussion. We've all been joined in this battle to reduce, combat, discover, and overcome the COVID impacts. And like many other CGLR networks, our regional Suncoast campaign for grade level reading on Florida's West Coast quickly addressed the dual issues of reduced capacity of in-person summer camp programs and the need for high quality summer learning delivered directly to community members by innovating all summer programs to include digital delivery. With terrific community support, the coalition actually produced 100 This Book is Cool webisodes. We call them webisodes. And uh, I've, I've put in chat uh, the, uh, a link to them, but we brought in all these uh, celebrity, um, celebrity uh, folks to uh, read to children and that uh, really attracted everything from athletes to astronauts to all kinds of individuals and that uh, kept children and their families engaged and we were able to uh, uh, to serve some 5,000 children. Uh, we can continue to learn, we continue to learn like many of you about the connectivity issues, uh, equipment shortages and our digital deserts. Uh, this, this summer, we began a digital access for all initiative, which I have the great privilege of leading. Uh, the uh, CGLR series here, the last few that have focused on the challenges and how communities are responding, uh, have been very helpful in helping us to background our work as we take in everything that nationally is being done nationally, statewide, and loca local to learn and see how uh, it might apply in our own region. Today we focus on what states can do to support digital equity and spotlight some of the states that are taking the lead. So let me introduce our presenters and our commentator. Our presenters uh, are uh, first Abina Fazula is the Equity Policy Council in Common Sense's DC office where she works on a range of issues including privacy, expanding access to technology, 
and digital well-being. Prior to joining Common Sense, Amina was a tech policy fellow at Mozilla, where she worked to promote broadband connectivity in underserved communities around the world. Amina has also worked with the Benton Foundation, the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, for Honorable Chief Judge James M. Rosenbaum of the U.S. District Court of Minnesota and at the FCC. Jack Lynch is the Director of State Engagements and the Digital Bridge K-12 Project uh, lead at the Education Superhighway, the leading nonprofit focused on upgrading the internet access in every public school classroom in America. Since its launch in 2012, Education Superhighway has helped connect over 43 million students to the minimum speed necessary for digital learning. Jack became, began his career as a hardware engineer at Cisco Systems, but was driven to make a career change by a strong belief in the power of education to change the world. At Education Superhighway, Jack is able to combine his technical background with his passion for supporting K-12 learning. We have a commentator today too that after the presentations will give her observations from her very, uh, from her experience and uh, deep knowledge of the, the subject. Claire Park is a program associate with the New America's Open Technology Institute, where she researches and writes on a number of technology policy issues, including broadband access and competition, as well as privacy. Before supporting OTI's work, Park was a fellow at the German Academic Exchange Service and completed an MSc in Politics, Economics, and Philosophy at the Universität Hamburg. Her thesis examined the impact of algorithms on democratic norms and institutions. Park was previously an associate at the financial research company Third Bridge and holds a BA in government from Dartmouth College. Right now, we are going to take a quick poll. You've been putting in the information on your, the chat box or where you're from. And uh, now we, we're going to do a quick poll. You'll see it come up to uh, give us a sense of, of your region, urban, rural, tribal. So we just have a sense of who's on the call. If you do that quickly. Well, I assume everyone's finished that. So I think we're ready to start with our slides. Okay. So I, I think we'll start to get a bit of context. Amina, if you'd help us with this. Uh, let's start with uh, sharing what is the current state of play out there? What are states experiencing in terms of the digital divide? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Lori. Um, so for some that have been on this call um, during past sessions, you might have seen a, a longer presentation of this report. Um, I just wanted to quickly um, dig into uh, the numbers just to give us a baseline understanding of what we're looking at when it comes to the distance learning digital divide. Uh, next slide. Um, so just so we can talk through the agenda, um, we'll, we'll recap our report um, and then I'm going to preview um, some of the principles that we are planning to include in our follow-up report um, and we'll walk through um, some examples and uh, talk through some of the next steps. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think we might have skipped a few slides. There should be, there we go. That's right. <laughs> yep, there we go. Um, so our, our report um, 
tried to scope out exactly what the full picture of the distance learning digital divide looks like um, with a specific focus on the digital divide with respect to distance learning for both students and teachers. What we found was that about 15 to 16 million students make up this K through 12 distance learning digital divide. Um, and that's a combination of students who lack um, adequate access or um, uh, adequate device. Uh, next slide. And our concern here, um, which I think most of the folks on this call understand, is that um, without at least this baseline of technology support, um, when students are told that they need to go home to be able to access learning, um, we risk learning loss. And uh, other partners have tried to start to get a sense of what that's gonna look like. But even today, I think the Washington Post, there was an article that talked about estimates of months of lost learning um, in the UK where they actually had um, you know, a pretty robust um, distance learning option um, early in the pandemic. Um, and I know that's not this, the case in the United States. So I think we will likely be in for steeper learning loss. And um, some of the partners like uh, NWEA are looking at um, trying to get a sense of what that looks like. Um, next slide. Um, our report found that it didn't matter what state you're in, there is a significant digital divide. Um, and uh, even in the states that were best equipped, we were looking at one in four students lacking access to adequate internet or um, adequate device. And um, in the worst hit states, we were looking close to 50% of students would be lacking access. Um, so this is not something that, you know, only impacts a handful, you know, a corner of the country. Um, it, it's something that is definitely an issue in every state in the United States. Next slide. Um, we also found that um, this divide disproportionately impacted students of color. Um, and Native American students were particularly hard hit. Um, and we did see that geographically that rural areas did have a higher percentage, but then there were also very high percentages um, of students without access to adequate devices or internet in suburban and urban areas. Um, and so again, this is an issue that cuts across um, the country. Um, it's not really just um, cabined off to, to one region. Next slide. Um, and also our report found, um, you know, after pressure testing our numbers with industry and with educators, with state officials and with ed tech products um, that are driving a lot of the platform schools are now using, um, you know, we wanted to know what the speeds were to be able to really have high quality um, synchronous learning for distance learning. Um, so what are those tech specs? What we found was you really needed to have 200 down 10 up MBPS for multiple hours of two-way video without any kind of disruption. Um, it's really important to be able to have those high numbers, mostly because if a household has more than one entity, not even just a student, more than one entity that's doing a significant amount of synchronous activity online, so that's a Zoom conference like this, or a classroom, a Google Classroom, um, at the same time as someone else, you're going to run into um, issues around a disruption in service. And when it comes to kids, we definitely don't want their technology to fail them because it's gonna be very hard to get them back on track and get them connected back into the classroom. That's disruptive both for the student, but also for the other kids in the classroom and then how the teacher is going to be able to manage the experience for the, the digital learning in that moment. Um, we did see that you know baseline speeds of 25.3 um, made some amount of distance learning possible, but these are largely asynchronous uh, options. Um, and even, even if you are choosing something asynchronous, if you do have some moments of you know, a synchronous learning environment, something face-to-face, -face, and these are the type of high quality interactions that you'd like to have if you wanna really have wraparound services for SEL, or if you wanna be able to connect to a student that's really having a tough time, um, you know, this is going to be hard to do with those baseline speeds if there are other students or other users in the household. Um, you'll, you're going to have disruptions and pixelations. Um, it'll be complicated for the students to navigate. Um, 
And then also you're going to run in potentially to data caps. Um, and anytime you data cap a student, you limit their engagement, really cabin them off just to the assignment at hand. They can't really explore the educational material, material or follow their curiosity. So that's incredibly limiting. Um, and then internet enabled devices really need to be focused in on things like um, laptops and um, desktops. Um, and potentially tablets if you're talking about a younger student. Um, but if you're thinking about, you know, STEM applications or an older student, you really need to have not just a device um, like a laptop, but a device that's relatively high quality um, that can handle the type of applications that you want them to do. Um, next slide. Um, we costed out, you know, with this first year to close, uh, with the first year of closing, this distance learning digital divide would look like. And again, keep in mind, this is in the context of the pandemic. So we're thinking about, you know, how do you get to every student with what's on the table right now? Um, in part, that drives up the cost um, because we aren't able to do the sort of long-term planning um, that's needed to help drive down costs. Um, you know, so we're facing things like a, um, device shortage um, that raises the price of the devices that are left on the table that would be available to students. Um, and also when we're talking about connectivity, we know that we need to have high levels of um, high quality um, connectivity. And you know, without um, robust investment in um, infrastructure, you're really left with a handful of options in some community or just one option. And then you're really at sort of the mercy of that one provider um, that can often drive up costs. So um, at this point, considering the supply chain constraint, um, we think that the number nationwide is closer to the 11 billion number, maybe even a little higher because of the supply chain constraint for devices. Mm -hmm. um, and this would be something that, you know, we've costed out um, in order for the federal government to have a sense of what they should um, put into uh, upcoming COVID-19 relief package. Um, next step. Um, following this report, um, we got a lot of feedback and um, felt like there was so much activity happening already on the ground. Obviously schools and states have been really active since March in trying to figure out how to close this digital divide. Um, you know, we thought that there would be some value in trying to lift up what are some of the key principles, um, but also try to um, have a, the focus on not just sort of this immediate, um, you know, uh, what, what we experienced since March was a sort of immediate action to try to close the digital divide um, very quickly after the start of the pandemic. Um, our report sort of seeks to highlight, you know, the key pieces that really can be valuable in the long run um, for, for both schools and states as they seek to close the digital divide and keep it closed for students. Um, so our understanding was that, you know, maybe there would be a handful of principles that we'd want to pull out and highlight as well as take a look at what some of the states have already done, um, as well as um, not just states, but also cities and school districts. Um, and uh, the key, first key principle that we identified was an assessment. Um, most states, most schools, um, they're already doing some form of an assessment. Um, we think there's incredible value to be able to um, really find, fine tune and do a more uniform assessment um, because that allows us to have actionable data um, that can really help both policymakers, but then also folks um, on the ground in schools to be able to, to track um, progress and then continue to um, provide resources to close um, the digital divide. Um, that type of data is invaluable, um, especially when you think about the context of policymakers. So when we're seeking funding um, to support schools that are doing this work, um, articulating, um, with a high level of granularity to states and to federal policymakers, what that need looks like is going to be very valuable. And there's really nothing like it. So there's an opportunity, I think, for schools and states to really take the lead on assessment here. Um, procurement. Um, you know, once we have a clear picture of what we've got um, in hand, we want to make sure that um, 
we look at procurement in a really strategic way. Understanding that there are things like supply chain constraints for devices means that um, there are a few different pathways to trying to take advantage of um, scale um, and uh, you know, partnering with other school districts or partnering across the state to be able to procure devices, lower costs or guarantee a supply. Um, and then also when it comes to connectivity, um, ideally, we're looking for the most robust options so that we can really do a high quality distance learning program. Um, that's often working with a fixed provider and that can be complicated. Um, so there are different sort of options when it comes to procurement of connectivity as well. Um, and last is for funding. I think if we build um, an assessment and a procurement um, models or at least have the data in hand, um, funders have a clear picture of where they can step in um, if we're talking about private and philanthropic investment. But then also um, it helps drive policymakers to push for resources that can flow to states um, and to schools. And so I think there's um, an incredible value to sort of the first two principles that really flow to funding. Um, already we've seen some funding from the federal level that's being utilized at the states. And so we'll discuss that further. Um, but there are a few different things that um, I think both states and um, advocates in education can do to try to push for additional resources. Um, I'm gonna pass this along to my partner in crime. Um, and uh, he's going to dive into some of the details of assessment procurement and funding as well as the state models. Jack? Yeah, thanks, Amina. So we can go on to the next slide and I'll take each of the principles that Amina just went through and, and double click on each of them a little bit and talk about more details about uh, not only how we're thinking about this, but since this uh, webinar is really focusing on states, how different states have started to think about these different challenges. Uh, and the first one we'll talk about is assessment. And I'll, I'll tell a, a quick anecdote about Education Superhighway as I get into this one. Um, so historically, Education Superhighway was focused on getting high-speed internet access to school buildings. Uh, that was our entire mission and scope. When uh, COVID happened, that became uh, slightly irrelevant for the time being because so many students were at home. And so we quickly pivoted like so many others to uh, just kind of reacting to the emergency. And, and we tried to uh, work directly with uh, a number of school districts that we had uh, previous relationships with just to try to help them navigate the, uh, the crisis. And our instinct was to go straight towards uh, principle number two from the last slide, the procurement options, right? Everyone was trying to get solutions out the door, uh, try to get connectivity and devices into the hands of students as fast as possible. But what we kept finding with school districts that was making it so challenging to do that is that uh, there wasn't good information really guiding a lot of the purchasing decisions or the procurement decisions or, or, or being able to know exactly where the need was. Uh, and there's a reason for that, which is that school districts in the past, uh, before COVID, uh, for the most part, were not collecting any information about whether or not a, each student had internet access at home or whether or not they had a device uh, that they could access at home, uh, unless perhaps uh, the school district had a, already had a one-to-one -one take home device program. So this was very much uh, uncharted territory for schools. And uh, the, again, the, the thing that everyone kept coming back to is we need better data. Um, so we can go to the next slide and, and talk a little more about that. Um, and, you know, there were heroic efforts uh, across the board from, from at the local level from school leaders on uh, trying to quickly get better information. So uh, the most common approach that uh, we saw that I'm sure a lot of you were either a part of or experienced somehow was uh, surveying efforts. So school districts would send surveys out to students or families uh, about uh, whether or not they had internet access at home, what kind of internet access did they have, uh, did they have access to learning devices, things like that. Um, the challenge was that this was done a bit haphazardly because we were, you know, right in the middle of the crisis and there wasn't a lot of consistency in, in the questions that were being asked and, and in the responses that were coming back. Uh, and as you can imagine, since it was largely being driven at the local level, you know, each, each school district or each local education agency was sort of doing it a little bit differently um, and with different levels of success. So uh, it was not uncommon to have, you know, a 30% response rate for some of these surveys, which 
uh, might be directionally helpful, but to really solve an equity problem, you need to be able to get to the level of, we know at the you know, student level, which who has an access, who has access to a device, who has access to the internet and who doesn't. Um, and so that's, that's where we're uh, seeing movement towards and that's what we think is, is really important with this first principle. Uh, we need to uh, shift to having an understanding of at the student level, uh, what's the situation? And uh, Amina touched on some of these uh, points before, but once we have that information, it's going to allow us to understand the true impact of this digital uh, access gap on learning outcomes. It's going to allow us to really target solutions to the people that need them as opposed to having kind of more of the, the shotgun approach that, that a lot of people are forced to do without uh, good data. Uh, it's going to allow us to understand what's actually working and what's not because we want to be able to measure progress over time. Uh, we don't want to keep guessing, right? And then, uh, very importantly, uh, we can do a better job at the state and federal level of getting uh, more funding, more support to address this problem if we have better data. So, uh, you know, a lot of roads lead back to data and, and we think it's really important that data is something that's prioritized. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and again, because this uh, webinar is focused uh, at the state level largely. Um, there is a state responsibility and a state role for helping to facilitate uh, better assessment, better data collection. And um, an effort that we want to highlight here is uh, one that's really being led by the Council of Chief State School Officers or CCSSO. This is the association uh, of all of the uh, like state superintendents or ed chiefs across the, across the nation. And uh, CCSSO has worked with, with Education Superhighway to develop a, what they're calling a blueprint for state leaders on how to facilitate better data collection. And um, I've got a, a link on the slide that I, I think will be distributed afterwards. I can also put one in the chat here in a bit. Um, but on the next slide, we've got a, a, an overview of what's in that blueprint, so we can go ahead and go there. And um, there's really you know, three key roles that were highlighted in this blueprint is something that the state education agency should be focusing on when it comes to data collection about uh, digital access. And um, number one was establishing common data elements. So I mentioned that uh, in the spring, a lot of the efforts were really done at the local level, uh, a lot of variation in terms of uh, the questions that were being asked, the, the, the specific data fields that were being collected. Um, it's gonna be really helpful for everyone if we can start to standardize on some of that. And uh, the state is in a good position to help drive some of that standardization. So this blueprint, um, suggests uh, here are here's kind of the, the basic data fields that should be asked about. Here's the right way to ask questions uh, to get the data that you need. Um, you know, it's probably not shocking to a lot of people on this call that if you ask a your typical parent what their download speed is at home, they're not very good at answering that because uh, you know I know most people in my family couldn't answer that question. Um, so instead of asking a question like that, you can ask a question like, are you able to stream a video without having any problems? So uh, there's, there's been some thought put into what's the right way to ask questions to, to get good responses and useful responses from people and, and just standardizing that. Um, the second uh, key recommendation is to provide support to the local, uh, to the local level on data collection strategies and, and kind of pass this down and, and um, not only in terms of making requirements, because uh, you know we, while requirements can be effective, certainly uh, we don't just want to have requirements. We want to have requirements plus the way that we can fulfill the requirements. So there's there's some suggestions in the document about what states can do um, in that regard. And um, the other thing that the the document does is talk about uh, data management. And so um, there's, as you can imagine. Um, sensitivities around collecting any student level data on student privacy. Uh, there's also uh, a systems level uh, consideration, right? How do we make sure that it's easy to incorporate this data collection into things that the school's already doing, into their existing student information system, so that it's repeatable, um, so that it fits in with all of the existing processes and uh, a lot of good recommendations on that front. So. Um, that's the, uh, the, the role of the state, uh, or at least some of the roles of the state in terms of addressing the assessment piece. And there's a lot more uh, guidance uh, directed for states uh, in this blueprint document. And we can move on to the next slide. 
Um, so just to highlight a couple of states that have uh, already taken some action in this regard, and these are by no means the only states that have done something, but um, a couple of states have started to uh, require this data collection from local education agencies and, and required it in a standard way, which is uh, we think important in moving the needle. And so uh, the Virginia Department of Education uh, earlier in the summer uh, communicated to all of their school divisions that um, you know, reporting on student digital access is gonna be something that's, that's a standard requirement going forwards. Um, California, uh, also a slightly different approach, but they, they tied some of their uh, funding that they've created from, from the CARES Act to uh, making sure that schools are able to track which students do and don't have access to devices and connectivity. And I think we're just gonna start to see more and more of this uh, from states across the country and also at the federal level with the United States Department of Education. They're starting to think about, okay, what questions should we be requiring from states as far as reporting is concerned? And once those requirements exist for the states, they're gonna start to pass them on to the uh, uh, local education agencies. And so um, just something to get ahead of, something to start thinking about. And a lot of local education agencies already have started thinking about this, but uh, good to highlight again. Uh, and then on the next slide, the, the last thing I'll, I'll mention in the assessment section is um, to, there's, there's a lot of um, local education agencies that are still trying to get their hands around this uh, and still striving to get better data. And uh, this is certainly a busy time for uh, school leaders across the board. Uh, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's not only is it back to school, which in a normal year would be a challenge, but it's back to school uh, during the pandemic, which we know has uh, an incredible number of added uh, concerns and considerations for schools. But um, that being said, uh, there's, there's an effort uh, in the month of September to really support school leaders in, in doing a better job, uh, getting, getting more actionable data around uh, digital access. Um, and so uh, a number of associations, you can see them listed uh, on the bottom of this slide, uh, have, have partnered with us with Education Superhighway um, to uh, help kind of sponsor this campaign to, to help schools uh, do a, uh, get more effective data. Uh, on this issue and it's called Digital Equity Outreach Month. Um, there's again a link on this slide for uh, if you're interested in, in how you, as a school leader you can participate in that. Um, you, can, you can sign up. Um, but this is also being sponsored and, and one of the reasons I bring it up now through a lot of states. So the state of uh, Indiana, the state of Virginia, the state of uh, Wisconsin are all sort of doing their own campaigns at a state level to say we really want to encourage all of the local school districts to, to collect this information. And uh, it really is the first step in being able to uh, effectively close this gap. And I can pause there. Uh, Dr. Stryker, I don't know if there's any, any questions we wanna address now or, or keep going, but uh, uh, we'd love to give a chance for, for uh, you to comment on that. Uh, sure, I, I think the... Um the data collection and, and understanding. And I think the report that the Common Sense uh, folks did is so important because it began to really identify and give some parameters to what speeds are we talking about? What does it really mean to be connected? So that, so that districts could understand uh, what, you know, what, what really the parameters are because they're looking at in school and Education Superhighway did such a great job on connecting every classroom with a speed uh, of, uh, that uh, would support the learning in the school. But now this is a whole different, whole different challenge for, uh, for districts to have to uh, worry about what is in each home and how that supports the students and the learning. And whether that's COVID centered, it was already there with, ho with the homework gap that was, uh, has been discussed over the last several years. But just exacerbated with, uh, with, the, uh, with the current situation. So just a comment, and I noticed in, in uh, some of the chats, uh, there, are, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of comments about uh, this, the uh, challenges that state and communities are, are uh, facing. And you know, you're gonna talk next about the elephant in the room and that's funding, because again, there's a lot of comments that talk about the cuts that are coming both on the local level, state level, and uh, some of those price tags, like uh, six or eleven uh, billion dollars, 
uh, it's uh, it's it's just seeing how states can really uh, make a dent in this in this area that they really haven't had a responsibility for as much in the past on what that home access is. Absolutely, yeah. So let's keep going so we can get to those uh, big hairy questions about funding that we, uh, we've got some some commentary on coming up later. Um, so I think we can go ahead and go to the next slide and, and uh, this section will talk about some procurement approaches a few states have actually started to implement to try to address this gap. And, um, you know, we've got three examples to talk about that are by no means the only three examples, but we'll give everyone a flavor of, of some of the things that are happening at the state level. So uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And the first state we want to talk about is Texas. And so um, the Texas Education Agency has created a program with $200 million in their CARES funding. So that's a little bit of foreshadowing. We're gonna talk in much more detail about some of the things states are doing with CARES funding uh, in, the in the next section of this presentation. But uh, Texas has taken that money, created a fund, and uh, their approach was really to create a, a statewide bulk purchasing contract um, for hotspots and devices. So they've prioritized uh, a personal hotspot as, as a way to quickly get internet access to people that have a need right now. Um, as well as devices. And um, what Texas has done is they've set up a matching fund. So that $200 million is the state portion of the matching fund. Uh, districts who decide to participate in the program are uh, also uh, have to put up 50% of the funding that's required to, again, buy either devices or hotspots. And um, they're really prioritizing students that have a need and, and kind of the equity perspective here. So. Um, districts are allowed to purchase and, and be matched for um, as many devices and hotspots as they have to meet the needs of uh, economically disadvantaged students. So this is essentially students that qualify for the free and reduced lunch program. Um, that Those students are prioritized. If a school district wants to uh, buy additional hotspots or devices, uh, they can do that through the same uh, purchasing contract but there is no uh, match from the state for those. Um, so uh, this is one approach. Uh, it's, it's really a kind of a, an aggregation uh, procurement approach, I'd say, because they're trying to take advantage of economies of scale and get all of the districts working together um, so that they can get volume discounts on uh, these uh, internet access devices and these learning devices and uh, using their CARES funding to do a matching fund. So uh, that's our Texas example. Um, and on the, we can go ahead and go to the next slide and talk about a different approach. So North Dakota um, took a, a slightly different approach. And one of the things I really like about this approach is it combines both the uh, procurement principle uh, with the assessment principle that we just finished talking about. And so to explain how that worked, uh, North Dakota in the spring when all this happened, uh, they were actually able to move quicker than just about any other state uh, I'm aware of. Um, to get this process started and they, they quickly identified this you know, glaring need and tried to close it. So um, within a few weeks of, of COVID shutting down their schools, uh, the state was able to uh, do some daily gathering work and they uh, aggregated the addresses of all of their students, um, put in place some data privacy agreements with their service provider association uh, in their state and said, okay, service provider association, we want to show you, we want to give you the addresses of all of our students, and we want you to tell us, are you currently providing service to those students? Um, if yes, you know, how, what's, the, what's the plan they're on? How much bandwidth are they getting? What's the cost? If no, could you provide service to, to these addresses? Um, and so within a matter of weeks, they were able to do this data exercise with their service providers and understand uh, who didn't, didn't have access and what the service options were um, in terms of actual wired internet connections that could be given to the people that didn't have internet access. And through that process, North Dakota was able to identify that there were about 2,000 addresses in the state um, that students were at that didn't have connectivity. And out of those 2,000 addresses, uh, 1,865 of them could actually be very quickly served by existing infrastructure, uh, existing companies that were already there that already had the ability to provide service. And so the state worked out a deal with those service providers to uh, quickly turn on service for all of those homes. And um, that's, that's how they were able to you know, quickly address this problem. And uh, they're continuing to talk with these service providers about how over the long term they can continue to 
provide this access for the students that were connected through this way. So again, I, I really like this example because um, it was a way to partner with the private sector and uh, not only meet the need, the connectivity challenge, but, but also kind of this data challenge that we talked about. Uh, and also goes to show that uh, hotspots aren't the only way to do things. You know, hotspots can be a good quick fix, but there's uh, the wired solutions actually might be uh, more readily available in some cases and provide a more robust connection. Uh, and then we can go on to the third example, uh, which is from Connecticut. And uh, that'll be on the next slide. And uh, Connecticut is, I'd say, not quite as far along in terms of actually implementing their approach, but they've, they've announced what their strategy is. And um, theirs is also similar to North Dakota, one of kind of going out and partnering with uh, wired service providers to meet this need. Um, so the, uh, the state is gonna work with primarily cable providers and they've got six of them in Connecticut. And um, uh, in the Northeast states in particular, there's actually a lot of really, uh, extensive coverage from cable providers and wired internet providers across the state. So they're able to reach just about everyone uh, with these six providers. And the state is going to use some of their CARES funding to sponsor service essentially for homes of students that need connectivity for 12 months. Uh, they're hoping that that'll well, at least get us through this next year um, of, of connectivity. And um, for anyone that these providers can't reach, they're uh, working with an organization, a company called Kajit, that uh, specializes in mobile hotspots. But uh, the, the kind of unique thing about Kajit is they're really focused specifically on meeting the education sector, and they have the ability to work with any of the four major um, wireless providers uh, on their devices. So you're not just tied into one specific provider who may or may not have good coverage in the area you need it. Um, and then, uh, a, a, an extra wrinkle to Connecticut's plan is in addition to doing these things, they're creating 200 public access hotspots at community centers around the states. These could be like libraries or um, in some cases they're schools, in some cases they're, they're other just, uh, you know, kind of community anchor points uh, where they're going to open up uh, public access so that if people don't have a wired solution from one of the cable providers and if for some reason a hotspot's not working from them, at least they have somewhere they can go that's hopefully nearby where uh, they can still get online to, to, to do what they need to do. Um, so that was a quick run through of three examples, um, but, but hopefully that provides a, a flavor of some of the strategies we're seeing states uh, take on to address this problem. So when thinking of uh, all that you've put in front of us, uh, some, of, some of what you've mentioned is this uh, use of the CARES Fund. So mm -hmm. what has, uh, what's been happening on the federal level and federal investments? Because as what is, I hear looking at chats, the amount of states that have, or the number of states that have had to cut funding based on lower tax revenues, it looks like a lot has shifted to the federal level. We've had the CARES funds come, out, come, uh, come down to the states, to the local education agencies in some cases. So what, uh, what should this audience know about the use of CARES funds and how they might get more engaged and how they're being allocated uh, and uh, make sure that they, these issues are at the table? Yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll talk about that. And then I'm also going um, to, I'll, I'll speak to a few slides and then turn it back over to Amina because she has a really good perspective on this as well. But we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, just to give it an overview of CARES funding, and this may, this may not be new information for a lot of folks, but um, the, the CARES Act uh, created really two streams that, that are helpful for schools. Um, the first is called the Governor's Emergency uh, Education Relief Fund. You'll see an acronym GEAR uh, for that sometimes. And that was a $3 billion fund that was um, allocated to all of the 50 states. And it's really the governor's prerogative to uh, kind of determine how those funds get used, um, but they have to be used for education. Um, and then the second stream uh, was $13 billion for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Um, and this is funding that uh, for the most part flowed direct, uh, you know, through the states and, and straight to school districts or local education agencies based on the Title I funding formula, more or less. 
Um, so each state has, you know, based on that formula, gets, gets a percentage of these funds, each school district rather. Um, but uh, the other component of this funding source was that 10% of that funding was held at the state educa education agency so that the state can um, create their own programs to uh, provide addi additional uh, relief for school districts uh, for the various considerations on uh, that, that have happened as a result of COVID. And what I'll say is, you know, certainly the um, outlook for school funding in the future doesn't look great right now. It's not a rosy picture, right? We expect tax revenues to go down uh, across the, the board in the next few years, and um, that always adds up to budget cuts. Um, in the short term, there are some sources of new funding, though, and that's where we've seen uh, most of the activity around a lot of the state programs I've already mentioned, and a lot of that's coming from these, uh, these CARES dollars that have flowed to the states. Um, and we can go on to the next slide, too. Um, this, this map is just highlighting uh, 26 states by our current count that have taken uh, one of those two CARES funding sources that I just mentioned and made a program specifically for K-12 digital access, so specifically to either address uh, lack of device access for students or, or lack of connectivity. Um, now, this, I, I want to caveat this by saying uh, this may not be a complete list. Uh, there's no good way to track this right now other than trying to follow all of the individual press releases that states are putting out. So uh, it's certainly possible that we, we've missed some states and that uh, uh, maybe in the last few days, even states are continuing to announce programs. And what I'll also say is what we were trying to do here is highlight, again, programs that were specifically for K-12 digital access. That's not to say that there might not be other um, programs states have created that could help with K-12 digital access, but maybe that's not like the specific goal of the program. So, um, uh, you know, glass half full, good news that so many states are really prioritizing this issue in our minds. And uh, I've got a link uh, here, and I think Yoli might be sharing one in the um, chat to the detailed tracker that has a little more information on all the programs these states uh, have created. So would encourage everyone to check that out. And if you notice that your state's not captured, uh, please let me know and we're, we're uh, you know, crowdsourcing a lot of this information and continuing to update it. Um, but to, to highlight a few additional ones um, on the next slide, um, this will just give you more of a flavor of the things we're seeing. So the state of Indiana um, created six, used $62 million of their CARES money to create a grant program uh, that they're granting out to the uh, local school districts for student devices connectivity. Um, and also educator capacity is something that we're seeing a lot of uh, states and school districts prioritize, right? This is, we've got to remember, this is a new way of teaching for a, a lot of our teachers. And so there's, there's support needed there. Um, Missouri actually created kind of two separate pots of money that both can um, help to address the connectivity issue. So uh, one specifically for K-12 schools to reimburse their connectivity and one um, where they're actually reimbursing providers for some of the upfront costs that providers have to take on to put new in connections into homes. And then I already touched on Texas's $200 million program, but again, that did come from uh, the CARES uh, money. Um, so um, that's, that's sort of, a, a, again, a, a flavor of some of the different things we're seeing and, and some of the uh, relief that we're seeing for the, this connectivity gap and device access gap that CARES is providing. But um, I'm, I'd like to turn it actually back over to Amina now. And on the next slide, um, she'll highlight some of the uh, policy outlook, both at the state and the federal level that, that we're looking you know, towards in the future. Great, um, can I see the next slide? Um, so as we've been talking about this, I think I've mentioned it and Jack's mentioned it and I'm seeing it come up in the chat. Um, you know, there's issues around state funding, there's issues around um, uh, tax receipts starting to drop in school budgets and um, and I think Jack put it well that you know doing this sort of assessment and really um, demonstrating what is fully needed is actually still valuable um, to be able to drive um, potential funding um, to be able to support the work on the ground um, and there's a few different ways to try to um, to do that um, you know, so beyond, uh, you know, pushing for additional funding directly related to um, uh, distance learning, um, 
you know, at the federal level, um, and, and clearly an assessment would be really useful to that end. Um, but uh, there are other sort of broadband policies that are useful to engage in if you're trying to drive down the costs of, um, of uh, dig uh, distance learning or closing the digital divide for distance learning. And if you're trying to make it easier to close the distance learning digital divide. Um, uh, so at both the state and federal level, there are usually broadband plans. Most states um, have started to engage in some sort of development of a broadband plan. These are often um, done by the governor's office, or it could be done um, in conjunction with some other state level agency. Um, we haven't seen a ton in these plans on things like the homework gap. And now with distance learning, especially if states and school districts are doing a, a more of an assessment, I think there's a better understanding of all the pieces that are required um, for distance learning. This is a good placeholder to put in exactly what you need to be able to get the job done. Um, because oftentimes this can be a place where a governor's office will do a first pass um, when they're thinking about their next budget. Um, or, or, you know, to point a potential state legislator to if they're they're looking for what they need to do next, or um, a federal agency that's trying to understand, you know, what are states seeking support on, or where are their sort of holes. So these these broadband plans, I think, are incredibly useful. Um, you know, they don't usually mean that you're going to get money, but um, making sure that your language that's going to support distance learning is in there is going to be really useful. Um, so be specifics on supporting your assessments and data gathering. Um, any kind of data that you've developed um, by doing this distance learning work over the course of the past few months and then certainly as you do it further into the next year on specifics around tax spec speeds will be really useful. The types of devices you need to have in hand will be really useful. Um, the estimates of like what type of cost support is um, going to need to flow to a school to be able to do this will be useful. And then also the digital inclusion piece. And I think Alan from the chat had asked a question about this. Um, and certainly um, an assessment is a good place to ask some of those questions around digital inclusion. Um, if you um, are trying to understand, you know, what can the parents do in terms of supporting a student who's doing distance learning? Do they need support in order to be able to um, adequately um, stand by and provide support for their child as they do distance learning. So that digital inclusion piece, I think, is really important um, as well. And, uh, and having it in hand in the plan um, is, a, is a good place. It's a relatively light lift with no funding attached, but um, it's a good marker. Um, the other areas to keep an eye on are broadband deployment. That gets really wonky, and it's probably not a place where most of us um, spend a lot of time in, maybe except for me and Claire. Um, but, uh, but I think there's a real value in demonstrating why these types of policies matter to um, your field. Um, you know, I think what schools are encountering is um, this real hodgepodge of um, maybe some communities have great access, some communities don't have access, and it doesn't really seem to be really understandable. They're just these pockets. Um, sometimes it has something to do with terrain and geography, but oftentimes it's just a sort of hodgepodge of, of deployment based on sort of the um, return on investment analysis done by an ISP. Um, that makes it really hard to determine what type of service a school can purchase, who they're going to work with for procurement. It just drives up costs. Um, you know, pushing for universal deployment um, so that you know that everybody has access to some kind of fixed service, if it's at all possible, um, is really important. Um, that just means that, you know, at least you'll know your students have something. You know, for rural communities, for tribal lands, we find that there's um, a serious deficit when it comes to infrastructure, and that makes it incredibly hard and expensive to try to connect those students. Um, it's not just rural areas, though. They're, they're um, pretty big pockets of urban areas that have been left behind as well. And it's a matter of policy change to be able to make sure that deployment reaches them as well. Um, and again, 
the same cost that you're seeing in rural areas where you have to pay incredible amounts because there's no infrastructure is the same type of cost you're seeing in urban areas. And it really doesn't make any sense there because you don't have any kind of terrain argument to make. So pushing for universal deployment is really helpful um, to help drive down costs ultimately for the schools that are working on these types of distance learning digital divide programs. Um, and it also just eases the procurement process because you'll have a clearer picture of what's available. Um, improve standards. So when you do actually spend the money to deploy as a state, um, you know, making sure that you deploy what's actually needed right now as well as for the future. You don't want to have to keep going back to something as um, intense as broadband deployment um, uh, again and again and again because you got it wrong you know, two years ago. Um, and so making sure that those standards for deployment are really future proof. Um, we're already seeing with distance learning um, the incredible need for high speed, high capacity internet. Um, you know, the FCC broadband standard is set at 25.3. Um, and as I said before, what we found during our report was that that's just not enough to do high quality synchronous learning. Um, going forward, you don't want to deploy something brand new that isn't able to do what we need right now. Um, so, you know, really fighting for um, that uh, high level of deployment. And I think um, schools in the educational community are a really unique um, use case because you can really point very clearly to what are the speeds that would be most useful to you to have in your community. Um, and then qualified areas, um, making sure that everybody in your community has access to deployment um, also means that you've got to point to areas that might have had previous deployment, but it wasn't as good. Um, so for example, um, we've seen that there are some areas that say have, you know, 10-1 or, um, you know, basically dial-up internet. Um, and because they have some kind of internet, they don't qualify for any kind of deployment new deployment of technology, new deployment of a network. Um, you don't want that to happen because what will end up happening is that these communities just fall further behind. So we really need to make sure that what we consider to be unserved um, is something closer to, you know, 2525 as opposed to, you know, something like, I don't want to get too wonky, but like dial up. Um, and uh, making sure you do that just ensures that everybody gets deployed this um, high level of, um, of uh, high level standards of uh, service. I mean, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. Lori, I think this might be a good place to bring in Claire because a lot of this policy outlook area are observations and work that the uh, that her organization and her work has has focused on. So I, I'd like to bring her in now to comment because we put a lot of information out there. We are getting some Q and A uh, comments to uh, handle, and we want to make sure we have time for that. So. Uh, Claire, can you offer your observations on what's been said? And and because uh, you've been more on the advocacy, you've been more on the uh, on the competition and how to really uh, or deliver broadband uh, across the spectrum. So your your thoughts, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lori. Um, I I do work a lot with Amina as well too on on all these issues um, and. Jack, I really enjoyed listening to the different examples. Um, if we go to the next slide, I can pick up on something, I think, oh, actually this is not my slide, but uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I think something that I mean I was going to mention next. Um, well, I guess first my comments overall, um, I definitely agree on the three major principles that we need to be working on. Um, and I think that'll be really good to get granular data at the state level um, about like which students specifically are lacking access. But I do see, I mean, the Federal Communications Commission is tasked um, with the duty to collect accurate data on broadband deployment. And states also use this data to inform their own broadband plans, which are then in turn used to fund, um, get federal funding um, for from various funds like the Rural uh, Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, they use uh, the the existing federal data on what areas are underserved and unserved to um, have these funding opportunities. So I definitely think that one thing that we need to do is um, push the FCC to improve their data collection practices. Um, and in terms of funding and procurement, um, I really enjoyed the D North Dakota example, Jack, that you uh, mentioned in your presentation because 
um, I feel like it just emphasized for me how um, there's a lot of ways that we can work with internet service providers to make sure that people um, have, students and their families have affordable internet service, especially if the infrastructure already exists, but and it's just a matter of getting them connected. Um, I mean, a lot of, I've just noted two examples here about, um, you know, school districts aren't multi-billion dollar corporations like internet service providers are, and they're being expected to pay up front for, um, to ensure that their students are are being served. Um, so I, I do, I see a lot of potential there for cities to organize together and states as well to get better deals and our counter offers. Um, some of this can be done by just having better data on what, what different school districts are paying for what kinds of things um, and pushing companies to expand free service and benefits to the pandemic. Um, and also I saw um, in the Q and A or either in the chat, I can't remember, but someone had mentioned, um, that you know, uh, people who couldn't previous, previously pay for their service were being denied um, the opportunity to sign up for the affordable service that is being offered now or free service. And I definitely think that there's room to get these companies to forgive um, people who have been unable to pay their bills during this time and get them and you know service, uh, especially given the position that these corporations are in uh, compared to. You know, students and their families. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, uh, I think, I mean, it was going to mention this next, but I, I definitely see another way at the state level of uh, connecting more students and families is to remove state legislative barriers to municipal broadband networks. So municipal and community broadband networks can stimulate competition um, and introduce more uh, another service pro providers to the space, which can encourage existing incumbent providers to lower costs and increase speed and quality of service. Um, so for instance, in a state that was mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, in Texas, municipalities and municipal electric utilities are currently prohibited from offering some telecommunication services to the public, either directly or indirectly. And um, you know, it's really important that we have as many opportunities to get people connected as possible. And a lot of municipal and community broadband networks um, in different areas, for instance, in Longmont, Colorado, and also in Chattanooga, Tennessee, are actually prioritizing um, getting their communities and students connected and offering free service to school ch children and families who qualify for um, other federal benefits like SNAP and Medi Medicare. So um, I think that definitely removing these kinds of laws that prevent um, you know, municipalities and also um, other other communities from organizing their own network is is definitely a step that we can take. Um, I also saw in the Q and A, and I don't want to transition too much, but um, that someone had asked about uh, community efforts to expand like individual um, Wi-Fi networks, and actually that's some an article. I wrote an article with a technologist in our um, in my organization on this on how one might be able to set up a guest network on your own private um, network to just like have it open for anyone in the public to connect to. And I think that's definitely a good idea. Um, we've been seeing a lot of mutual aid networks pop up in, in various cities and um, just opening up your private network for someone else to use, especially if you live you know, in a household that doesn't have as many people um, is a really just kind of a low lift way to help um, your neighbors. So yeah. With that, um, I'm happy to move on to Q&A. Okay. Uh, I also would, uh, th if you would bring up the slide uh, that has the next step for parents, funders, and school leaders, because I think that's one that we might want to have in front of us as we uh, work uh, work through some of the questions that uh, that were that were put to us uh, in the Q&A box. And I encourage you to add your uh, that's not the slide. The one it's got, let's see, go, go back. One more. There, that next step. Okay, come down one. <laughs> Sorry. There. Next up for parents, funders, and school leaders, because I think that's who we have on this, on this call, people that are working with, uh, with whether they're with philanthropy, nonprofits, and working with the, uh, the Campaign for Greater Level Reading uh, coalitions, uh, that's, that's sort of the uh, to-do list for us. And, and some of you have asked in the uh, Q&A questions relevant to this. So uh, I'll, I'm going to uh, 
do some of the questions and have our panelists uh, respond. And uh, the first one is uh, whether assessments include technology competency. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about is machines and connectivity, the internet connectivity, but how are we dealing with competency and uh, how we uh, also work with parents on best and safe technology used for their, their children. So uh, anyone that's done work in that area that would like to comment on that question. Sure. Um, so at Common Sense, we worked on a digital citizenship curriculum um, for K through 12, um, and that's been used by uh, many of the public schools in the country. Um, but it's um, you know more designed for for students. Um, there are also a whole host of digital inclusion organizations that um, focus on doing technology training for um, adults. Um, so to the extent that um, you know, the caregiver in the room with the child needs to have some support. Um, I, would, I would look to organizations like the National Digital Inclusion Alliance to find out if what resources are available in your area. Um, and, uh, and then when it comes to um, uh, privacy and things like that, um, uh, also Common Sense does, um, you know, a privacy review of um, a tech products. Um, and then our wide open schools platform has had um, put in some language about, you know, how to do a bit of a privacy screen and um, prepare um, your sort of technology environment at home um, to do this type of distance learning and just kind of stay aware and stay protected. Um, I think those are all valuable um, sort of supplemental materials for schools to consider to provide to, to students and their families. So we could put some of those links on the uh on our chat as well. So that's great. On, another question uh, about the, uh, which organizations would you recommend to assist consult with, with a regional effort to address the connectivity challenge, both urban and rural? So it sounds like maybe, maybe the, I don't know whether it's a region of the country or a region of a state. I mean, in my, in my situation, our 700,000 have you know the most rural county in the state, and one of the and one of the much most urban. So, are there organizations that can work across that urban rural? Well, um, one, I mean, education superhighway can can potentially help there. Uh, that's one of the things we do, as long as it's uh, focused on getting students connected. That's that's uh, sort of our scope. So. Uh, I would offer us up as, as one uh, group that you can approach and we can explore that further. I'd say in general, um, you know, there's bring, broadband is sort of a big tent problem. And what I mean by that is the, the best way to solve it is to really bring everyone to the table. And when I say everyone, I mean, uh, you need the, the sort of community advocates, you need funders, you need uh, government officials, whether that's state, local, federal, you need uh, uh, who else? There's, there's, I could probably rattle off, you know, 20 different types of groups that are, that are good to bring together. So um, I don't know if that's specifically what, what this question was, was getting at, but it, it's certainly uh, what, what we've observed is the, the more of a coalition you can build with different groups, the, the more likely you are to have success. Uh, of course, as long as you have good structure and, and clear leadership, but um, it, it, it sort of really does take a village to solve this problem. Lori, can I jump in and just sort of um, bring in another related question, Jack? Um, I'm just wondering if you would agree um, that that's a first step to engage your state if they're not very engaged. It's one of the questions from Angela. What's the first good step if your state isn't doing anything? Um, so is there anything beyond being part of a coalition? What other, what other, other advice would you offer? Yeah, if your state isn't doing anything, um, one, yeah, I'd, I'd ask them and say, hey, point, point that out to them. But, um, you know, the, the, that's the power of advocacy can be strong here. And, and I think the groups that we've got on, on the call and on, on this webinar are, are uh, probably have some experience in that front. But, um, you know, this, this is a political issue, too. And, and uh, the good news about this issue is it's sort of got bipartisan support. So there's, you know, everyone agrees that this is an important problem to solve. Um, but if, if your uh, local leaders, uh, either at the local or the state level, aren't, aren't prioritizing this, let them hear about it. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll respond. And I, I, Nina, I don't know if you have any other uh, suggestions there. 
Yeah, I mean, we started a Connect All Students campaign to try to drive the stories of teachers um, and parents to policymakers at the federal level. Um, but we've also, you know, worked pretty closely with um, state policymakers to try to kind of get a sense of what they're up to and support them um, if they are moving forward. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would definitely say that right now in this moment, um, you know, any state that isn't taking this on as an issue that's important is, is really the odd man out. I mean, most states are really trying to grapple with this and find a way forward. Um, so I would, I would definitely try to do your best to lift that up and you can reach out, um, to me, uh, or, and I can connect you to, um, organizations that might be working on this issue in your state. Well, another another aspect of this is how in, in your state, uh, where is the broadband uh, leadership coming from? You know, a lot of times it's in the economic development department, and it may be less in the education area because a lot of it's seen as this is going to make your state competitive. And not only are our kids at home, but workers are at home, and and access for them, uh, were the workers and. Uh, and companies and growing your economy are all part of the mix. So who's really managing this in your state and how can you connect the economic value uh, to the educational needs? Because I think they can be connected. You've got the same people at home working at home or also have kids at home. So how can we partner and have those coalitions at the local level and uh, make sure whoever's handling it at the state level is including the education uh, option in the mix? Yeah, and most states, just to that point, most states have a, a state broadband office um, that, you know, the, the, the exact structure of it can be a little different state to state. A lot of times it's, uh, it rolls up to the governor's office. And so um, that's, you know, look that up in your state and, and reach out to those people if you're just trying to get started and figure out, you know, what's actually happening right now. There are comments and questions about the funding challenges. So what, what opportunities are there were to work with the, uh, with the uh, providers and to bring them more into a partnership uh, with, uh, with providing, uh, you know, affordable, accessible, uh, and things that they may work with, their lo with local governments and, and helping to uh, jointly develop networks or enhance networks. What's the, what's the provider opportunity? What's that landscape look like? Uh, maybe Claire, in your work, because uh, you're, you're looking at the competition piece, uh, any thoughts on that or anyone else? I mean, did you wanna take that? I saw that you had unmuted yourself. Oh, I was just right. gonna say, I mean, I think private providers are in a moment where they are fully aware that everybody is looking at them um, for support. And um, I think they understand that they are part of, you know, critical infrastructure right now. And so, um, you know, it, to knowing that, I think schools and states should take advantage of that and really um, bring them to the table with very specific asks in mind. Um, if you need them to support your assessment, do that. If you um, are looking for, you know, some kind of low cost or discounted broadband, um, you know, don't just sort of ask what they've got, but really have, you know, what speeds you want um, and, and, and be really specific about what price point works for you. Um, I think there's a lot that schools and states can ask for right now because um, broadband providers are, are in large part doing very well <laughs> in this moment. And so, um, and they're under a lot of scrutiny. So I think um, there's value in really bringing them to the table and then giving them real clear direction on what you need. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And again, like Jack, from your examples, it sounds like they are also interested in, in doing things and we shouldn't be afraid of asking um, them for whatever we want, like whether it's extensions of free internet offers or um, no more data caps. Um, I mean, a lot of these things, these the ISPs did um, early on in the pandemic, and some of them have uh, 
let go from those commitments now. Um, but I mean, obviously we see what position we're in now and we should not be afraid of asking them to continue those kinds of benefits. Um, I was actually reading an article today about um, a local group in Colorado who organized um, like faith communities and labor unions to meet with Comcast executives about connecting um, school children to the internet. And so it can be, it, you may not even have to go through your, your state, like hopefully you can work with your state broadband office, but you know, given our needs, um, we can definitely, there's opportunities for local organizing and local meetups with um, ISP executives too. Yeah, quite yeah, to know. that point, go, go ahead, uh, maybe, Nelly. sorry, Jack. No, go um, ahead. Might be all related here. Um, I, you know, there is such anxiety around, you know, cuts that are happening across um, all states, all <clears throat> counties, and even at the local level, especially, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, and at the same time, we know that there's an important role for the federal government. You both have, the three of you have talked about that. Um, is there an organized effort with organizations like you mentioned CCSSO earlier, National Governors Association, um, other major groups, um, Education Commission of the States, is there a coordinated effort um, that is uh, working together um, both for maybe additional resources from the federal, um, at the federal level, and then better coordinating that across states? Is there, do you see that on the horizon? I mean, certainly I know that most, most of the advocacy wings of education groups, uh, education affinity groups are working really hard at the federal level to push for funding. Um, because of the sort of concerns around state budgets, um, I think that, you know, everyone's sort of understanding that it's unlikely that a state has more they can squeeze out. Um, those states are prioritizing what they can. Um, and so it's really pushing on the federal government to unlock new funds, whether it's through another COVID-19 relief package or, um, you know, going forward, something, something larger, something more permanent. Um, uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of effort there. And then like Jack pointed out, you know, the existing funds that have started to flow, that's in large part due to the efforts of education advocacy groups. So, um, you know, I think, you know, the fact that there is CARES funding and that there's a, um, funding through the governor's um, um, funds too, that's starting to flow. I think that's, that's all positive. Um, but yeah, there are, there are certainly coordinated efforts to, to ask for more at the federal level. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, Laurie, I'll give it back to you for additional questions. I do want to alert our audience that in a moment they'll see uh, the the final poll come onto the screen just for feedback on this webinar. So as we're completing the Q&A, we ask folks to share with us um, their uh, response to this webinar. So I'll hand that back over to you. Thank you. Well, they are, uh, if we think about other, because I think on this call, you don't want to walk away from here of what, what do we need to know? How can we apply it with our, our own work in our communities, and uh, we have uh, you know, foundations that are on the call. We have uh, nonprofits and so many others. And uh, I think one of the questions I see is how how can these private partners, the foundations, the private funders, help? What is the most specific things that they can do to make a difference? And something that's huge. If you've got a six or eleven billion, that's not something that foundations are likely to be able to do, but how can they incentivize, how can they innovate? Uh, what approaches are going on out there? We, we've heard things about bundling where the, uh, where nonprofits have, uh, or foundations have helped pay for a certain set of people that are, are need access. And they've done it in a, you know, sort of that bulk purchase that you talk about in some of the procure procurement. Uh, have have any of our panelists seen some of those approaches how on how uh, private funders and donors can be helpful in this uh, in this time of where well, we need innovation and we need uh, we need action? Yeah, I, I'll um, oh, go go ahead, Amina. Sorry. I was just going to say very quickly. I think schools have done um, 
a good job of trying to, to get um, supportive funding um, for some other aspects of uh, distance learning. So things like headsets or keyboards or other aspects like mouses. Um, so I think like, you know, there's a pathway there to sort of drive, you know, once you have your assessment um, in place, you know, it's easier to kind of identify where you can drive different levels of funders. Yeah, and the example I was going to bring up that I believe might have been raised on a, a previous webinar in this series is um, uh, Chicago Public Schools actually partnered with uh, local philanthropy. Uh, I think Citadel was was sort of the, the lead uh, funder in that effort, but um, they also brought in uh, many other funders in the area to actually provide connectivity for all of their students who are unconnected. And so instead of having to rely on you know CARES money or something else, it, it came from philanthropy. Um, and, and the funders partnered with the school district and with the service providers um, to, to deliver on all of that. But I think um, there's a great opportunity for uh, local philanthropy to, you know, sponsor your local school or sponsor your school district for six months or 12 months, um, you know, whatever you can do. But um, that's, that's a role we saw. And there's all here, I'll put in the chat a, a detailed case study we have on Chicago that also kind of explains the role of the funder. Um, and then, you know, related but separate from that uh, for any other community-based organizations, um, you know, CBOs are really good connectors between kind of like the school district and the families, right? And, and oftentimes they sit in that spot and school districts sometimes struggle reaching families and, and then on the data piece, for example, and, and being able to actually understand what the situation is. Um, so there's an opportunity for some community-based organizations to play a role there and help be the connectors and help drive responses. And also um, in the Chicago situation, once the program was set up, the CBOs were the ones that came in and helped to educate the families on um, here's what's now available to you. Here's how you get signed up and, and trying to make sure that they had the support that they needed. Thank you. Well, we're just about uh, ready to wrap up uh, the, our, our uh, time together. And I want to thank every, all the panelists and for uh, sharing their, their insights, their report, their information. I, I do think in, their, uh, in this next report that's going to be done, uh, in a combination between uh, between the Common Sense Organization and the uh, Education Superhighway, there might be an opportunity for some for some help and, and some eye guidance and ideas uh, from this audience. So, uh, and does Jack or Amina, do you want to say anything about how this uh, combined uh, experience out in the field could could help inform the work that you are planning in this next report? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we think from the last report and from the experience that Jack has with Education Superhighway um, that you know there's value in trying to highlight these principles and dig into the details. Um, but we'd love to hear from this group. Um, you know, if you think there's anything else that we should include or or how we should approach it to make the report more actionable and useful. Well, thank you. And I think we're about to uh, wind up. Anything else, Yoli, that we need to do? Um, no, let me just say that I very much appreciate um, all our partners who continue to help us lift up this important topic around digital equity. As I shared at the beginning of the hour, um, we've had three uh, webinars with um, many of the same presenters with a different angle. We talked, we did, by the way, Jack, in the last session talk about um, Chicago Connected uh, learned a lot about that work and other municipalities and Claire actually brought that to our attention. Um, previously to that with New America um, and a, a different partner from OTI, the Open Technology Institute, we talked about the, um, the extent of the problem. So we're trying to tackle it really from different angles. And then of course today, you all um, honed in on the states. Um, very, very um, helpful, I think, to everyone. And we'll continue to lift up um, these and other important digital equity issues um, and others related to learning loss and learning loss recovery. Um, so let me thank each of you, Dr. Stryker, thank you. And thank you especially to the Patterson Foundation. The Patterson Foundation is an enterprise 
investor and philanthropic supporter of the Campaign for Grade Level Readings. So we're always um, thrilled to have you with us and, and part of our work. Thank you for your support. Um, Jack, thank you uh, for bringing us to the Education Superhighway um, and all of the work that you were doing. We're excited about your next report in collaboration with Common Sense Media. So Amina, thank you for joining us again. And then of course, Claire, um, thank you for always your insights and um, additional um, wisdom and your voice of advocacy in particular about all the work that we need to do, especially um, around these very concerning gaps that continue to grow um, for students from low income families. So thank you to all of you. Let me just close by sharing with our viewers the next set of webinars coming up next Tuesday, actually. Um, we shared at the top of the hour that next Tuesday we have two webinars. Um, we'll start in the early part of the day with a um, focus on prioritizing learning and sharing with you some essential guidance that has been developed for schools and parents to assure that we're not, um, as we try to recover from the unfinished learning for kids, um, that we don't um, spend all of our time around remediation, but that we actually pay attention to acceleration and making sure that kids get the learning for their current grade level. So join us for that next Tuesday at 1230 Eastern. And then in the afternoon, our partners from PBS are joining us again. Um, PBS is offering uh, an alternative to the challenges around digital equity because of their power with broadband media and the high quality content learning that they offer for, especially for young children. Um, so next Tuesday, they'll share with us the work um, around uh, Eleanor Wonders Why. Um, it's new programming around uh, learning in the science space, and that will be at 3 Eastern. So we hope you all join us. Thank you for being with us today, and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you all. Thank you.